us back and put it online and try to then you know kind of dilute it down so we could get everybody to do exams and stuff safely so we didn't want we didn't want to stop it and thankfully we didn't have to so these are the different courses that um, we run in the NZ Centre in Enniscorthy. So the fundamental awareness is kind of literally the basics. Um, it just goes into part L and part F. Whereas the ventilation course is just apart from the um, directives and a bit of background about EPCs and CPCs, it concentrates on part F and the insulation commission guide. We also have a really popular retrofit course. So that's down in Waterford Training Centre. And um, the fundamental awareness is the pre prerequisite for that course. We also do site supervisors. And then we do the trades courses, which is electrical, bricklaying, plastering, carpentry, and plumbing. Okay, so everybody has a part to play in achieving ends of compliance. And of course, I have to give a plug to the company that I work for, which is MassArt. So we're contracted to the WWETB to provide this training. So we do a lot of design, um, architecture and landscape, energy consultancy, passive house certification, and then we do all the ends of training in Enniscorthy. So again, back to the three documents that, um, you know, kind of underpin NZEB and are there to give us guidance. They, um, Again, part L is the overarching document, but because that defines our air permeability numbers, um, part F then backs it up and shows us how we can ventilate right if we're going to build airtight. And then the last document there, which is a lot of the time very overlooked, and that's why I'm concentrating on that. It's the installation and commissioning of ventilation systems for dwellings achieving compliance with part F. An awful lot of people who are years um, in ventilation uh, and even in the last couple of years, they rock up to me in Enniscorthy and they've never even heard of this document. So how they can achieve compliance is kind of beyond me. So we do use them in unison. Um, generally, they back each other up. There's a couple of um, examples further on of where part L and part F kind of part ways a little bit. So I'll, I'll just highlight that as well. So we would use this support and documentation a lot for fundamental awareness. So that is limiting thermal bridging and air infiltration. So, you know, these words are being thrown around a lot, but the basic understanding is not really there yet. So this is the 2021, well, it was reprinted in 2021. Um, it came out in 2019 as well. So it's just, there's the additional, it's of uh, internal insulation details that weren't there previously. Um, it doesn't really change the thermal performance and the details, to be honest with you, they can be improved upon. So when we think about design and ventilation systems, there's a couple of things that we have to think about before we put them in place. So firstly, the design itself, where am I going to put the ventilation system? Is it going to be in the attic? Am I going to have room um, as my utility? Is it going to be, end up being a plant room? Have I got an allowance to drop my ceiling to um, put all of my, uh, duct work into? Do I need service cavities? When you think about that, then you have to think about the construction, you know, and part D materials and workmanship. What materials am I going to use? There's no point in using materials today um, that, you know, will fail over time. If you're going to make your house airtight, it has to be airtight for the lifetime of your building. So competency then, are we putting the right tapes and membranes in the right place? Do people know what they're at? Again, construction, the materials, the amount of materials will all depend on the airtight strategy, okay? So we need to think about airtight strategies when we're thinking about construction as well. And also, and that's why we do all the trade specific courses, it's about teamwork. Everybody on site has to work towards the same goal. Our ventilation strategies then, really there's only two, mechanical and natural, and everything else then is a variation. So part F covers natural ventilation, continuous mechanical extract ventilation and mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. And each of those ventilation strategies are based on your air permeability result, okay? Then your air tightness, what results do you get? What results were you trying to get? Um, did you use the right materials? You know, are they fit for purpose? Did they fail? Is that why you didn't get your air tightness test? Again, your air tightness is directly reflective of your ventilation strategy. 
if you don't get the airtight result that you want, do you have to redesign? Do you have to start retrofitting in a ventilation system? So where do we start when you think about uh, designing a ventilation system? It's a bit like the chicken and the egg. Which do you put first, the air permeability or the ventilation system? A little bit about building physics. I won't go into this in too much detail, but just so we understand the principles of what we're trying to do here. So heat always wants to flow from an object with a higher temperature to an object with a lower temperature. And that's just the second law of thermodynamics. So if we understand how heat moves out of buildings, we can understand how to slow down or stop it. Air leakage then and air tightness, it works on the fact of the second law of thermodynamics plus positive and negative pressures. So where we have a house and we have wind driven um, infiltration. So infiltration and exfiltration is the uncontrolled flow of air through your house. Okay, so you've cold air here and then you've warm air trying to blow out. So what happens is the um, wind driven, sorry, the wind, the positive pressure on the left-hand side of the house here is on the prevailing side. The air comes into the house and we always heat it, we say 20 degrees because deep use is 20 degrees. So we always heat everything to 20 degrees. So we'll say we're heating that to 20 degrees. And now the warm is trying to get to the outside to match up with cold. And not only do we have a positive pressure here, so nature hates an imbalance. So we have a negative pressure on the far side. So any gaps or cracks in the building, the air is going to be forced out and it's literally going to be pulled out as well. That's on a wind driven day. But even without wind, we have what's called buoyancy or passive stack. So what happens is the air heats up, it rises and it tries to get to the outside. As it rises, it creates a negative pressure. So the cold air spills back in. And that's just basically infiltration and exfiltration. So part L is trying to cut down the, on the amount of uncontrolled ventilation, okay? And then I know it sounds daft, then we punch holes into our house to let air in, but that's controlled, okay? Another thing we have to look at when we consider air permeability is um, the fact that condensation and vapor ends up in, our, in the interstice spaces in our building construction, especially in timber frame. So we have to understand that vapor molecules are much smaller than air molecules. So while you wrap something in insulation, you can stop heat loss or cold getting in, but the vapor will get through that bat insulation. That's why you have to have a vapor tight insulation. It's really, really important. So if your building is not airtight, here we have just a typical timber frame building. Our inside we're at 20 degrees and outside is really freezing. It's about minus 12 on that scale there. So the vapor laden air is trying to, warm is trying to get to the outside and heat up cold and it's taking the moisture with it. So on this side is the warm side of our insulation. Okay, but as it passes through, it ends up on the cold side of our insulation. So we're, now we're down below our 9.3 degrees and that's when condensation happens. So what we need to do is make sure we have an airtight barrier and a vapor control layer so we can stop the air, it's airtight, but we can only control the amount of um, moisture that gets through. When it gets to the outside, then we have to have a vapor open, wind tight barrier on the outside. So we have to, if that condensation gets in there, we have to let it breathe to the outside. So where do we put our air tightness membrane? It's one continuous airtight vapor control layer on the warm side of the insulation. Okay, now there is the two thirds, one third rule where you can have one third of your insulation on the inside. But we want to be very careful that our condensation risk doesn't happen within the fabric of the building. So you can, oops. So you can see here, the red line is continuous. There's a couple of weak points that are often overlooked in construction. Okay, so we be always saying to people now to keep an eye out for the likes of how do you get that airtight membrane before you put your floor in. So there's certain things that you have to flag. And then part L deals with continuous uh, insulation. So you want to be making sure that yellow line is going continuously all around the outside. Your windows are part of your insulation. And then we have connections here with the likes of thermal blocks. So this is our blower door tester. Um, again, not to duplicate everything, but they must be accredited um, with the NSAI or INAB. These uh, measured at 50 pascals, so it's a bit like deep heating everything up to 20 degrees to see what the heat loss is. 
this one does it to 50 pascals. That's the pressure difference between the inside and the outside. So basically what you do is just make your house, um, seal up all your windows and doors and make sure they're all closed. And then you just extract the air out of the house at 50 pascals and measure how fast it comes back in. So again, in N 9972 recommends testing in both directions, but NZ only requires testing in one direction. And again, every dwelling must be tested. So there's no more room for default numbers. So air tightness and ventilation then. So our previous upper limit was uh, seven, as was mentioned by Gary. Um, now our upper limit, and that's the worst, that's the backstop, okay? We can't go any worse than that. Once we go below three meters cubed per hour per meter square, we have to have some form of continuous mechanic mechanical ventilation. That's with or without heat recovery, okay? So just to put it on a scale, that's where passive is, all right? So passive is at 0 0.6 air changes an hour. So air changes an hour and meters cubed per hour per meter squared are roughly comparable if you're talking about small scale, you know, domestic. It's, there's not a big difference between the two. So you can get a rough idea of three meters cubed per hour per meter squared is roughly three air changes per hour, okay? You're only allowed natural between those two numbers. And again, if you want natural, you want to be aiming for the five. You can improve that, but once you get to three, you can't take stuff off basically. You know, it's very difficult to uh, think about what you're going to do now if you're gone below this number. And I always think of, um, you know, the contractor. He's got 300 houses. He was aiming for natural ventilation. Uh, all of a sudden he's on site and he's gone down to 2.5. And now he's thinking it's not one mechanical ventilation system, it's 300 I have to get now to get compliance. So to be honest with you, a lot of the time you see them going for the absolute backstops that are in part L and part F, um, just to get compliance, just to get them off their books. They're not really future, future proof in the house. And like Gary said, there is instances where people slit membranes. So if you slit a membrane a meter long, just a millimeter wide, it will take on the equivalent of a can of Coke, 330 mils a day. So that's an awful lot of moisture going into the fabric of your building. So not only do they slit uh, uh, membranes, which a lot of lower door testers have copped onto, they prop up an attic hatch as now as well. So they just stick a little bit of wood in the attic hatch, make the house appear leakier than it is. Once that little gap has been sealed up, you've relatively new houses in a couple of years time, huge mold and condensation issues. So once we go below our three meters cubed per hour, this is where we have to have our continuous mechanical uh, ventilation. Again, with or without heat recovery. If you just want to hit between your three and five numbers, sorry, pre-NZEB, so before NZEB, two to three meters cubed per hour, right? So that was the average. It was getting between two and three. So there was a lot of houses that were built to be naturally ventilated that were already too airtight. If you want to build between your three and five, or that's the air permeability that you're going for, you don't really have an assigned role on site. You don't have to worry about tapes and membranes. Uh, a good sand cement plaster, your vapor control air, that will suffice if you just want between your three and five. If you want to get lower than that, especially down here with really good numbers, you need somebody what's called a dedicated air tightness champion. So it's their role on site to have tapes and membranes and make sure that any services that come in, any perforations to the membrane are sealed up. So again, we're talking about build tight, ventilate right. That's a buzz, you know, that's a phrase that's been going around a long time now, but people are only starting to think about it lately. This is inside the airtight house in Enniscorthy. So, um, Again, we're pushing principles here, not products. So we have a mishmash of um, Partel and Intello and Sego, Sega and Tyvek, all kinds of membranes in there. Um, so we're not promoting one uh, membrane above the other, but if you go out on site and you see something like that, it wouldn't be ideal. You have to think about compatibility of materials. So if you have the likes of the Intello membrane, you will get a 10 year warranty if you use the Tesco Vanna tape with it. If you use the Partel tape with the Intello membrane, six year warranty, okay? So you have to really think about compatibility of materials. That blue Tesco Vanna tape is actually accelerated age tested in the Castle University and that's supposed to last hundred years. 
So whatever types of membranes you put in, you need them to last the life, lifetime of your building. So below three meters cubed per hour per meter squared at 50 Pascal, we have to provide mechanical ventilation, ideally with heat recovery. So if you see the example on the right hand side, now you have to think about dropped ceilings, where are you going to put your ductwork? We don't want to put it up in the attic. So we'll have a look further at that. So where is air tightness been going? I suppose the regs part L 2002, there was no mention of air tightness. Then um, 2005, 10 was acceptable. 2007 and 2011, we were down to seven meter cubed per hour per meter square. So that all changed in 2019 with the backstop going down to five meters cubed per hour per meter square. And um, as Emmanuel pointed out, uh, 2.8 is the end of reality at the moment. Um, again, we know that between three and five, we're allowed to have natural ventilation, but there has been houses that have slipped under the radar and they've been naturally ventilated and they're actually too um, airtight for it. The reality on site then, uh, this is the statement that, you know, it's cost effective for the contractor to be going between the three and the five, but for the homeowner, you want to be going down here and I'll explain further as we go on. So part F states that vent ventilation systems should be designed by competent designers. They should be installed, balanced and commissioned by competent installers and how to achieve competency. The easiest way is to come down to the WWETV and do the course. Um, it's, you know, it's a really robust, it's, it's backed up by City and Gills. The quality assurance is very good. And going forward now, all ventilation systems must be validated by an independent third party. So we can't drive that home enough. So the ventilation course then to demonstrate competency, you must pass the course with me. So it's made up of two parts. So there's an theory assessment. Um, so that's everything out of part L, not everything, but it's, you know, it's based on part L, part F and the installation and commissioning guide. Um, it's an open book exam. We're not testing anybody's memory. We just want them to leave the course knowing where to find the information so they can use it practically on site. It's an hour and a half, okay, and it's a 70% pass rate, which is quite high, but the pass rate itself is about 90%. Most people get through it, but we do have a few that fail, and nine times out of ten, they'll come back and do it again, and it's generally just a language barrier, to be honest with you. It's just part F, if anybody's read it from start to finish, is quite technical, um, so if English is not your first language, it can be a little bit difficult. So to kind of make it fairer, then we have a practical demonstration as well. So that's 30 minutes one-on-one, -on -one, and that is how can you balance a ventilation system? So the 30 minutes to balance it, to adjust the diffusers until the supply and the extract are equal, or if they're not equal, they have to be done in compliance with part F, which states that the supply can be no more than 15% higher than extract. And the reason that is because we'd rather be in a bit of positive pressure and pushing out the toxins than negative pressure holding on to the likes of radon or VOCs in our house. So that's really important. So that's simple pass fail. Um, pass rate for that is very, very, very high. Okay. So um, Manuel talked a little bit about uh, calculating mechanical ventilation. So did Gary. So I'm just going to focus on natural ventilation, just not to re repeat it. Uh, part F is, is very, you know, particular about what is a wet room, is a kitchen, a utility, a bathroom or a sanitary room. Habitable rooms then are other rooms and there's other little rules and regulations about that as well. So what we have is our background ventilators. So they're just your hole in the wall, right? That's how you have supply and extract. So the intermittent extract only comes on every now and again. So when they're turned off, you're dependent on your background ventilators for cross ventilation. Again, they have increased with the new regs. So they're 40% more holes in the walls or they're 40% bigger. So for anybody who thinks that ends, you know, natural ventilation was fine before ends up, why isn't it fine now? There's actually too many holes in the walls. We can't set up that positive negative pressure. So that's why you have to have mechanical ventilation once you go below your three meters cubed per hour. So the extract then are just in the wet rooms, okay? And they're either on a light switch or a pull cord or whatever. So they're just intermittent. They're not relied on for really for ventilation. The background ventilators in the habitable rooms are 7,000 millimeters squared. And the background ventilators in the wet rooms then are three and a half thousand millimeters squared. 
So this is table three and page 22, part F. So this gives you the requirements. So you cannot go below these minimum requirements. And that's what needs to be checked on site as well. The extract then is given by the table in uh, part F. So you must, you must have these kind of extracts from the different rooms, depending on the function of the room and the requirement. So they also need to be checked and the validator comes out and checks the actual flow rates for natural ventilation. Um, there was a question there about purge ventilation. So I have a slide on that further on as well. So purge ventilation is a requirement. I had somebody the other day there tell me that you don't need open up the windows anymore if you have an MVHR. So God love him if his electricity ever fails, he's no way of opening the window. So it is a provision and it is a requirement. Again, um, if you go to try and calculate natural ventilation calculation, it's quite difficult. Okay, so we break it down into just simpler four little steps is all you need to, to take. It's not rocket science. I'm not going to go into it. If you want to know, you have to come and do the course. So if a dwelling has more than one exposed facade, similar equivalent areas should be located on opposite or adjacent sides of the dwelling in order to maximize cross ventilation. So we have to have cross ventilation in every single ventilation strategy. So there's um, two ways of calculating the background ventilators. So you can have the free area, which is just the hole that's in the wall, or you can have the equivalent area. So obviously if we had just holes and walls, we'd have birds and insects and everything coming in. So we have a grill on the outside and a mesh on the inside. So the equivalent area has to be the area of a single sharp edged hole that passes the same air volume rate at the same applied pressure difference as the vent being tested, okay? That's really important. The free area can be used to assess compliance, but then you have to make the, the ventilator a quarter bigger. Okay, so that's worth noting as well. The equivalent area is influenced by the coverings on both the ends. So that's provided by the manufacturer. No one's expected to work out the free area of that mesh. But what happens a lot of the time, especially be your assessors to tell me, they come along and they find that the outside grill doesn't match the manufacturer of the inside one, and they won't sign off on that. So they have to be by the same manufacturer. If an installer doesn't use the full background ventilation system, the manufacturer's equivalent area will not be accurate. And that's why it doesn't uh, pass the test. I suppose the really interesting one for natural ventilation is when you have a single sided uh, dwelling. So where you have only one exposed facade, you have to double the requirement. So you work it out and then you have to double it. It also has to adhere to the um, the regulation set out in table three. So it says that you must have high background ventilators and low background ventilators, and there must be one meter between the two. So let's have a little example of that. So this is actually a, a case study that Mossart did. So the little middle um, apartment there, it's 106 meters squared, 106.7. So it's roughly 10 by 10. So we did a natural ventilation calculation on that. So when we worked it out, every house, no matter what the size of it, gets 42,000 millimetres squared. Then you decide, is the house a big house or is it a small house? So once it goes over 70 metres, you add on 7,000 millimetres squared for every full increment of 10. I'm not going to get bogged down with this now, but I'm adding on another 21,000 millimetres squared. The dwelling is single storey and it's situated on level two. And part F states that you must add more ventilation for that. So when you add the three figures up, you get your 70,000 millimetres squared. So for this little apartment here, because there's only one exposed facade, okay, so there's apartment to the side, to the back and to the other side, there's one above and there's another one below. So when you do the ventilation requirement, it ends up that you have 18 holes in the wall. Okay, so that's 16 five inch vents and it's two uh, three and a quarter inch vents. And here you can see that there's a window there, there's three windows here, another window there. There's not even wall space to put background ventilators into it. So if you have to double up that requirement, you're talking about structural issues there as well. So it's really impractical to have natural ventilation if it's single sided, it's very, very difficult. The solution eventually the client went with CMEV because with CMEV, you can reduce the amounts of holes in the walls that you have. This is CMEV, which is Centralized Continuous Mechanical Extract Ventilation. So instead of having our intermittent extract vents in our bathrooms and all of our wet rooms, now we have one centralized fan in the attic and that extracts 
from all of the wet rooms continuously, 365 days of the year, nonstop. As that air then, sorry, as the system, the fan works here, as it pulls the air out through the dwelling, these background ventilators then, because it creates a negative pressure, the air naturally spills in to fill that void. So our airtight, um, our continuous vapor control air is on the inside, the warm side of our insulation. So we're assuming here now that that's insulated um, on the ceiling level. So every time you have um, a diffuser coming down into your wet rooms, you're breaching this airtight membrane, which means now you have to think about how am I going to seal that up? Have I got tapes and membranes to do that? We're also dragging warm air. So this is all, we'll say, 20 degree space. So we're dragging the warm air up into the cold space in the attic. So now we have an issue of condensation. So part F is really getting down in the weeds when it defines what insulation you should have on the ducts in the attic. Also, it says that you must insulate this upstand on the ductwork as well, because you don't want the condensation running back down into the unit. But there's no heat recovery. This is where it kind of ticks all the boxes for part F, but doesn't really go with conserving fuel and energy. Demand control ventilation then, Gary mentioned it, so I'll just briefly go through it. It's very like CMEV, so it has a constant extract demand, or sorry, constant extract, uh, then it ramps, it goes down below the general ventilation rate when the demand is not there. So when the demand is there, the fan clicks in, and then the exhaust units, it extracts to the exhaust units. So these are these red ones here, back into the centralized fan, again to the outside. The difference here, instead of just having normal background ventilators, there's a little restrictor on the ventilator and it's on a humidity sensitive strip. And as the humidity increases in the room, the background ventilators open up and they let some air in. The thing about this is you just have to be careful that your house stays in balance all the time. You've technically gone below the general ventilation rate, which is why they've produced their Agramon cert. But you still have to be very careful that you're not in a negative pressure. Again, there's no heat recovery. So this is mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, our MBHR. We suggest, now it's not a requirement for NZ, but it is definitely a recommendation that you put it inside the thermal envelope. So we have our centralized little unit here down in our utility room. We have diffusers for extract, similar to our CMEV, but now we have diffusers for supply. So we've no background ventilators and we have a relatively airtight house. If we keep it down inside our thermal envelope, inside our airtight membrane, then we don't have any perforations in it. We've only got one that comes in, so your intake, and your exhaust are the only two that breach your airtight membrane and your continuous insulation. So now these ducts here are cold. So we have cold ducts now in a warm space. So these have to be insulated as well. So how it works is it extracts the 20 degree heat into the MVHR unit. It recovers up to 90%. So if we 20 degree heat, we'll say 18 degrees it can recover. So now it can supply 18 degree heat into the supply rooms and you're only exhausting two degrees. Now it's even come another step, there's other units out there that will take that two degrees, dump it into your hot water tank, or if you have the likes of a compact unit, it will use it as a preheat for your heat pump. So there's absolutely nothing wasted. You can, like I said, put your MVHR unit up in your attic, but if, if you're insulated on ceiling level there, you've got a lot of problems. Um, you're paying a lot of money for a heat recovery system to hang on to that heat, to conserve all of that energy. And you might as well send it around the garden, insulate it and send it back in again to the house. So you're basically, once you take it outside your thermal envelope, it's outside it. So the only reason, or the only way it would really work in the attic is if you have your insulation on the slope of the attic. Okay, then there's plenty of usable space up there. So this is where um, achieving compliance comes in. So that was just a little bit about part L and part F. So there's a lot more to the course than that. It's three half days online, um, one full day in the training center. And now that we're back in the training center full time, it's three full days in the training center. So we also cover um, the installation and commissioning guide. So this is achieving compliance of part F. And if people have never read this, I don't know how they can install um, systems in compliance. 
So it covers the mechanical extract ventilation, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery and natural ventilation. And the verification of flow rates by the independent third party should be included as part of the ancillary certificate issued for the vent dwellings ventilation system. So there's lots of um, help and guidance in that document for compliance. So again, um, where am I going to put my ventilation system? So we say avoid putting your ventilation equipment up in the attic. So if you're anything like me, you know, you probably go up in the attic once a year to get the Christmas decorations and shove them back up there, which is looks like what's happening here. The ventilation system is buried in here at the back, as you can see, not getting the love and care that it deserves. At the end of the day, it's our lungs, so we need to be looking after it. You can see here on the right hand side, the ventilation system is actually underneath that piece of timber. And we can't see what's going on at all. If you have it upstairs or up in the attic in that cold area, you have to um, insulate all of your ducts. So we're saying they're not a great idea. Access and use then. So the location of the equipment should be allowed, or sorry, should allow sufficient space to allow uh, access for maintenance of filters and to remove the heat exchanger. So you can see over here on this side, this Ventaxi unit, somebody installed it right beside the um, timber member there and that's where your filter is so you can't actually sort out that filter to change it. I was doing this one time in class and the fellow who actually installed that was sitting in the class <laughs> and I asked him why and he said the timbers weren't there when I put it in but I don't believe him. <laughs> okay so nobody is going to take a saw to the structural timber in the roof just to change a filter on an MPH tower. So a lot of the filter uh, a lot of the machines now if the filters get so clogged they'll just shut down and they won't work at all. So if you have dirty filters, the dirt will end up going in on the heat exchanger. So every now and again, about every two years or so, you have to take out the heat exchanger and give it a clean. So as you can see here, it's blocked. So you can't take that heat exchanger out and you can already see that there's mold building up on the heat exchanger. So what you don't want now is to be supplying that into your bedrooms and inhaling it at nighttime. we're saying there that's not great either again this is another example up in the attic you should be um you know you should be able to maintain it and uh, change the filters without the need to remove uh, fixed structures or significant length of connected ductwork so you if you get to the end of the life of your unit it's grand if it's broken you can break it in bits take it down to the attic hatch but if you don't have an attic catch big enough to get a new one up, now you've got problems as well. So a lot of the time the attic hatches get trimmed out and you won't get a large, the likes of a Vantaxi unit. Now my battery's gone. You won't get a Vantaxi unit up into the attic. Not a big one like that. So here's another um, couple of directions out of the Installation Commission Guide. The fan should be installed um, on a suitable sound structure, which is stable and level. So that's neither stable nor level. Okay, it's dangling there on one timber. The condensate drain should be adequately secured where it's passing through an unheated space, and it must be insulated to prevent freezing, not a screed of insulation on that. So I had a chap in my class and he was saying his unit shut down because the condensate drain actually froze in the attic. So he didn't have adequate insulation on it. So that's really important. Ductwork, there's lots of rules about the ductwork. So you must minimize the duct length and minimize the number of bends. Okay, and that's why semi-rigid and rigid ducting will ensure that sharp bends on ducts do not occur. Okay, so you're talking about nice slow sweeping bends. That's why flexible ducting is no longer allowed. So we need rigid or semi-rigid. So minimizing the number of, duct, or sorry, minimizing the duct length, all right? So by simply turning this plenum towards the unit, we could take off about 900 mil there. So I'd imagine if you got your anemometer out, measured that, turned the diffuser, connected back up the ductwork, you get a lot higher flow rate. So then you can turn down your fan a little bit, lowering your EPCs and CPCs in the end. So they're not great examples either. That one's not bad. So again, the Insulation Commission Guide and Part F state that rigid ducting is recommended in all locations with the exceptions of short lengths. So less than a meter just to connect up extract air grills. So as you can see here, sorry, 
as you can see here on this, I have two on the go now. So as you can see here, this um, piece of flexible ductum has been shoved into the corner. So now it's at a right angle. So that's not a slow sweep and bend. So that fan there was going to have to work twice as hard to get the air out of that. Air flows like water, it flows in vectors. So if it hits a solid surface, it takes a lot of energy for that air to change direction and flow a different way. So by minimizing the number of bends and making them slow sweeping bends, you're reducing your fan power. Again, this is another example of long runs of flexible ducting, which aren't really adequately um, bracketed up there either. Um, the Northern Ireland regs say 300 mil, so they really hate this stuff. So 300 mil is all you're allowed in Northern Ireland. Again, insulating ductwork. So if you're insulating ductwork against condensation in unheated spaces, you must have the equivalent of 25 mil of a, a vapor type material having a thermal conductivity of less than or equal to 0.04 watts per meter Kelvin. So they're really getting down in the weeds about what type of insulation. And again, you must insulate the upstand on the duct. So nine times out of 10, it'll stop there at the ceiling level. And then they don't insulate the upstand. So we normally have about 150 mil upstand if we don't have a, a roof vent or a tile vent. So what happens is in the last 150 mil, it will just condense and run back down into the unit. So it says here as well, additional insulation may be considered to reduce heat loss from the duct. So again, if that's an MVHR unit, you're trying to hold on to that heat. You want that heat going into your supply rooms. If you're sending it up into the attic, you have to insulate the whole lot to try and keep the heat into the ducts. Now, you want to be running your ducts as well from A to B. So this duct here is running all around the house. This is the same attic and all the way, and then it ends up way down there. It would take an awful lot of pressure off the fan if it just went from A to B there without running all around the house. Now, I get that people want to floor out their attic and they want to use it as storage, but to be honest with you, um, the ventilation system deserves to be looked after as well. So a condensate drain, so it's really important. We've got hot and cold hitting each other, so we're going to have condensation. We've lots of vapor-laden air coming from our wet rent, uh, steam from showers and kitchens and stuff like that. So the condensate drain should be installed from, to, uh, from the fan unit to an appropriate drain location. Okay, so that needs to go to the outside. You need your little U-bend on it because you don't want any back gas. So if you put that in a waste drain and there's any smells coming up, it'll come back up and end up in your supply rooms. So you need to have your little U-bend. You need to ensure that that's kept clean as well. We had a, an issue with a fella who had said his, his MPHR unit was leaking, so he turned it off. And uh, Tomas, my boss, said to him, did you have a look at the valve? And he said, what do you mean? So we explained it to him anyway. And uh, he was doing a long passive designers course. We came back the following week and he said, I fixed it, it's great. He said, I did what you told me to do. So he's delighted, he said, it's not leaking anymore. And uh, Tomas said, that's great. How long was it turned off? Three years. Okay, so that's what you're up against. People just don't do a simple thing like that. Especially if you're doing your air permeability or blow door, sometimes they close those valves off. So you have to make sure that they're turned back on again. So the condensate pipe should be installed to have a minimum of a five degree fall away from the fan. To be honest, you're lucky if they're there at all now, let alone have slope on it. Slope horizontal ducting away from the fan unit, obviously you don't want it ending up going back into the unit. So that's good. Condensation, okay. So if the fan unit is not pre-insulated, insulation should be added to minimize the potential of condensation forming within or on the fan unit casing. So you can see here, there is condensation running down. You can see the little trails of it. This was a unit, the one further back on the slideshow that you couldn't change the filters. So because the filters hadn't been changed, all the dust and dirt was ending up in the unit. So this is the supply end of it. So Mold reproduces by uh, producing these little spores and it spits them out. So that was going into the supply rooms. So all duct connections should be sealed. Where the ducts are installed against a solid structure, this can be achieved by assembling and sealing the ductwork prior to fixing, which is grand. But if you have a big, long stretch of ductwork, it's pretty impossible to do that. So nine times out of 10 on site, what you'll see is uh, a bit of airtight caulk, the two pieces of ducting are put together and you get a little uh, self-tapper screw to hold it together. Otherwise, you can have um, a piece of airtight tape on your ducting. So you use your applicator card and you take all the wrinkles out of it and you make sure the connections are duct tight, are, are duct taped up tight, sorry. Over here then we have, yeah, okay, it's taped up tight. Uh, 
it's wrapped around like whoever was wrapping it definitely didn't pay for it. So there's two and a half times too much tape on that. They never use an applicator card to smooth down the wrinkles. So when you smooth down, the, use the applicator card, the glue in the airtight um, tape starts to go off and it goes off for 24 hours and then it's at stickiest. So if you don't activate that, you might as well be putting tape on it. So again, you have to make sure that the ducts are sealed to the air tightness barrier. So anywhere where you have a duct coming down, you must seal it up. So here we have one duct coming down on its own. That's not too hard to seal up. Now we have a couple of ducts coming down together, a little bit harder to seal up because there's timbers and all behind it. You must get that tape all the way around it. Part L actually got a query in from somebody as to how to make that airtight. That was what they were left. This is the airtight membrane peeled back and there's about 10 ducts coming down there. So that's nearly impossible to make airtight. So we're saying that's good, that's questionable and that's not great at all. So if you keep everything inside your airtight membrane, you don't have to worry about all this stuff, okay? There's way less ducts that you have to uh, think about making airtight. Now, there was a mention of the 10 mil gap there earlier. What it states is 7,600 millimeters. So that's a 10 mil gap on a 760 wide door. If you have a wider door, you have less of a gap, okay? If you need to put an inch mess and seal that will only you know, swell up to eight and a half mil, put a wider door in, okay? Or put a transfer grill with an inch mess and seal in it either. Doors which are required to achieve a fire rating determined by part B must achieve both the requirements of the fire door to start and the airflow requirements, okay? So there's no get out clause there, you have to do both. There's a couple of different ways of doing it. So you get your undercuts and doors, okay? And I know that systems that haven't been passed, I know of a fellow, he came in to commission a system and he said to the contractor, you don't have the undercuts and the doors. And he was like, what are you on about? So we explained it to him anyway, and off he went, he said, I'll come back next week. Comes back next week and he says, oh, you put the undercut in the door. And he was like, yeah, sure, you told me to. He said, 10 mil, not 10 centimetres. So they cut 10 centimetres off the bottom of all the internal doors. Again, it's about communication on site. So you can have a transfer air grill either. All right, so you can put intermessence into that as well if you need to be a fire door. You can also have a hit and miss vent. So sometimes a lot of noise transfers, you know, maybe from a hallway into a bedroom or whatever. So if you use the hit and miss vents like this, so this would be in your internal corridor and that would be going into your, your habitable rooms then. And uh, it just slows down the noise a little bit. Again, um, carpenters don't like those undercuts. So they've started putting overcuts in doors. So if you're doing an inspection and you don't see obvious undercuts, check the architrave for an overcut in the door as well. So extract terminals should be installed in a ceiling or as close to a ceiling uh, level as possible to ensure that warm moist air is removed. And that makes logical sense, doesn't it? Because the warm air rises. But if you have a vaulted ceiling and you put your extract right up in the very top of that, it's very difficult for somebody to commission it and to validate it. So um, that's where it should be. It should be up no more than 400 mil from the ceiling level. Again, control indicators. So they must um, indicate to the occupant that the, occupant that the system is operating correctly. If a fault has occurred, and control indicators should be in a visible uh, location. So when Part F came out first, um, there was a big scramble, especially on CMEV units, the likes of Eco, were trying to get control indicators for their machines. Um, it shouldn't be in a remote location, so it should be wired down into your kitchen or living room or somewhere where you can see it. The MVHR then must show if maintenance is required as well. So it'll tell you when your filters need changing. So you want to kind of have a stock of filters as well. It'll tell you when the filter needs changing, but it won't give you a couple of weeks to change it. So it's not like rocking up to Woody's and getting hoover bags. You need to have the right filter for your machine and you need to have a stock of them. So thermal bridging, when you consider MVHR, so now we have it down inside our thermal envelope. So this is inside our house. This is our construction. It's, I don't know, cast concrete, block on flat, whatever it is. So if we have two ducts going in, and out of our building, we're creating thermal bridges. So we have to have a look at that. We have to keep the continuity of the airtight barrier and the insulation. So what we do is core out a bigger hole than the duct, fill that with insulation, okay? Take a photograph of it. Then you put your airtight tape on to make it airtight because we know that uh, 
vapor is smaller molecule than air, so the vapor can still get in there. Then we're going to wrap the entire duct with vapor tight insulation as well. And again, we'll put more tape there because vapor molecule is smaller than an air molecule. And that's the way we do it. So now we have continuous insulation all the way in. The unit is insulated. So now we have this continuous insulation and there's no thermal breaks in it. So the cold air ducts should be wrapped additionally with a vapor barrier outside the insulation. Okay, so it has to be vapor tight insulation. Again, we want to avoid cross-contamination. So you don't want your exhaust air coming back in into your intake air, okay? And that has been an issue uh, with machines, say um, the supply rooms are getting the smell of air freshener in an office block, it was an example given to me. The supply rooms, the office blocks were getting the smell of air freshener. And what happened was the exhaust was on the windy side of the intake, so the air was blown back in again. So they just needed to change them around a bit. Locking the system, really, really important. So once um, you've commissioned the system, you have to ensure that the terminal or grill or diffuser or whatever you want to call it has been locked in position once the commission has been achieved. So you have, now do this before you commission it, else you have to take the whole thing off again. So you take the diffuser out, you put a little nut on it there, and you put another one at the top. So when you've turned it to the desired airflow that's been calculated for you, you put the two nuts to each other, and then now you can't move the disc because I guarantee you people come along to clean them, especially the extract, because dust and dirt sticks to them. So they try to clean them and what are they doing? They're changing the flow. Um, it's vital for the correct operation of the system that the system remains in balance once it's been commissioned. We had a fellow tell me a story about, um, he was servicing the system. So he said, being vigilant, he said he'd run around and check the flow rates. He checked them and he said uh, to the lady who owned the house, what were you doing with them? And she said, oh, nothing, I, I never touched them. And he said, come on, the supply is in the extract and they're all mixed up and the flow rates are gone. So she eventually confessed that they got a bit dirty, so she put them in the dishwasher. And that's true. So that's not what we want. Um, if you commission a system, you'd kind of want to know that the validator is hot on your heels because you don't know what can happen on site in between. Um, a lot of the time, painter decorator is the last one in. If he has a ceiling to paint and there's lots of diffusers, he'll just take them down, fire them in a box, he won't know where to put them back up. So natural ventilation, there is uh, rules and regulations about it. Um, for through the wall units, the hole should have a slight downward angle. I rarely see that now, to be honest with you, it just goes straight through. But that's to prevent water from going back into the fan. So that's a good install. The duct sleeves should be rigid, all right, and you often get this from cooker hoods and stuff like that where they're just shoved out and there's no great care or attention put into them. In situations where this is not possible, flexible ductwork may be used, providing the extract ventilation rates are not compromised, so these have to be checked for validation as well. Flexible ducting should be pulled taut, all right, so that fan has to work twice as hard to get the air out of there because the duct is all um, puckered up. So rigid ducts, rectangle or circular should be used where possible. Circular ducts often the, offer the least resistance. Okay, so the air flows better through the round duct than it does through the square duct. Again, if you can cut down the amount your fan has to run, the, you know, the more the better. Flexible ducts should be kept to a minimum um, and only to connect to rigid duct work. So we're going again for the rigid duct and we're leaving the flexible duct off. This is a big book, bear in mind. Um, okay, so where you have an extract duct and it's in the wall, that's fine. You can have an axial fan. So that will take the air out parallel to the way the air comes into it. And you're only allowed flexible ducting of 1.5 meters. This is an axial fan, but it's in the ceiling. So the ceiling, the warm moist air is up closer to the ceiling. So now this fan is trying to pull the warm moist air down and get it into where the fan is. So that's not the right place for that fan. This is what a centrifugal fan looks like. That will take the air in and then it will throw it out at 90 degrees to the, part, to the air that's coming in. So as you can see here, the vents are up close to the ceiling. So it pulls the air straight out and then pushes it up into the attic. So there's different um, little fins on it. So they scoop the, up air, the air up and they send it out. So for that one, for the flexible ducting on a centrifugal fan, you're allowed to have six meters of ducting um, for small rates and then 
three meters of ductum for larger rates, so anywhere where between 31 and 60 liters per second. So for condensation, for natural ventilation, it's the very same rules. They should be insulated against condensation um, in unheated spaces with the equivalent of your 25 mil um, having a thermal conductivity of less than or equal to 0 0.04 watts per meter Kelvin. So this will be typically what you'd see up in the attic. You have your extract fan come from your bathroom, a bit of flexible ducting, and it's probably sent to the eaves vent or something. So on this particular example here, this is what the homeowner could see. So we have a big damp patch on the ceiling and it's purely down to condensation because the duct turns into slate. Again, there was a mention of purge ventilation. Um, yes, it is covered in part F and yes, there is hard and fast rules about that too. So going forward, if your windows open, whoops, open more than 30 degrees, okay, the opening part should be 1 20th of the floor area of the room, okay? If it opens, if there's restrictors on it, so if it opens more than 15, but less than 30, um, the opening part should be at least one tenth of the floor area of the room. Again, if you have a couple of windows, you can add the opening areas together. So it's not such a big deal. And a door can also be used, but it must be one twentieth of the floor area of the room if there's no windows in it. Now there is in the back of the insulation commissioning guide, um, there's a tick box there for inspections, which makes it an awful lot easier because, you know, it's easier to know what you're looking for. So I ask you a couple of questions. So what are the equivalent areas? It's the total um, installed equivalent area of background ventilators in the dwelling. So does it match up to what the design flow calculations were? What's the total floor area of the dwelling? So you need to know that as well. So you have to look at section 1.2 of part F, does the installed equivalent background ventilator meet the requirements? Have the background ventilators been left in the open position? I mean, you know, mostly they are closed, that little slot is closed off on it. At, at best, at worst, it's been taken off and there's a cushion or something in it. Are the extracts in accordance with the tables? Okay, so you need to go back to your tables one, two and three there and find out. Is the installation complete with no obvious defects present? Yes or no, simple. Do the internal doors have the undercuts to allow cross ventilation? Um, is the system functional? Does anybody turn it on and actually see if it's working? Um, is the ductwork insulation being good? Is there any air resistance or leakage? So when we're talking about air resistance, we're talking about shoddy ductwork with too many bends on it and it's not going from A to B in the shortest run possible. Do we have adequate background ventilators? And is the room for access and maintenance? That's something we really do have to start looking at. That's for all ventilation strategies. For CMEV and MVHR then, um, is the system balanced? Do we have the connect ductwork insulated in the right place, especially in unheated spaces? Is the condensate drain there? The condensate connection is complete and drains to an appropriate location. Okay, so there's no point in having a condensate drain there if it's not going to an appropriate location. So this is the commissioning sheet. Um, so this is taken straight from the insulation commissioning guide. So when we do um, the ventilation course, what we're doing is we're working out the design flow calculations for all the different rooms in the house. So this is extract and this one over here is supply. So you work it out for each room. And this is where the confusion starts when I'm given the course, because part F talks about general ventilation and it talks about boost rate. You go to fill it in on the commissioning sheet and they talk about design airflow minimum or trickle rate. And then they talk about design airflow maximum or boost rate. And it's thrown the cat among the pigeons there big time. So this on the right, a plus you read it from right to left for some reason. So this is your general ventilation rate. You, you calculate them, you fill them in, in those boxes. The measured airflow rate on site then is what the commissioner does. So he measures it on site and he writes down the answer that he gets. The same for the boost, you calculate it and then you measure it on site. Same for the extract and the boost on extract. So these are all calculated and these are taken from part F. So they're Table one for CMEV, table two for MVHR, but it's exactly the same information. You're allowed to have a tolerance on them. So if it's a reading above 10 litres a second, you're allowed plus or minus 10%. Okay, so anything that's above 10 litres a second. 
If it's below 10 litres a second, then you're allowed a one litre a second tolerance on that reading, okay? And I'd be always saying to lads, leave the tolerances for the validator. Let the commissioner get a pretty bang on and let them worry about the tolerances. Again, the system completion and handover, the operation and maintenance information for the system. It should be included as part of the safety plan. It should be handed over to the building owner on completion, and it should uh, contain specific instructions for when the end user, how and when to use the ventilation system. And that includes that it should never be turned off. The information on the intended use of the available fan settings. Okay, so, you know, set back mode, that's not for when you're going to bed at night, that's for when you're going away on holidays. You know, you need to know when to use the modes in the right place. System components should be cleaned and maintained. So it gives information on that. So you can't expect the homeowner to understand it if you don't give an, an o and manual for it. So how does ventilation um, influence our energy performance? So this is a case study generated by DEEP. So that's the dwelling energy software that they use for the BER assessment. So over here on the left-hand side, we have our energy value. So that's in kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. And on the bottom here, we just have different ventilation strategies at different vent, uh, air permeability numbers. So I know this is not allowed anymore, but I just put it in there for the, to show the trend. So you can see here, natural ventilation at seven meters cubed per hour per meter squared, you've got 50 kilowatt hours per meter squared. So we just going from seven to a five, making it slightly more airtight, we're saving energy. Then we go from five to three, we're saving more energy. Now we can't go below three with natural ventilation, so we're going to use CMEV. So we just pull down the tab in deep and we put CMEV in instead, left the air permeability where it was, and now look where it is. So CMEV performed worse than deep in our example here. So we'll see what savings we can make then by putting an MVHR unit in. So we're leaving the air permeability number where it is, simply changing the ventilation strategy. And this is the one that the homeowner makes the savings with, okay? Again, it goes back to the chicken and the egg. So if you get to the fact where you've ended up between your three and five grand natural, if you go below your three meters cubed per hour per meter squared, well, you have two choices then. You can either go to CMEV and pay for it for the rest of your life, or you could go for an MVHR. Once you've paid for it, you're going to start making savings then. So it's going to be cost optimal for the homeowner. So <clears throat> if you've been trying to build an air permeability, for this here, and now all of a sudden you go too low. Now you have to go back and uh, you have to retrofit in a ventilation system. If you're gonna use a ventilation system, you wanna get the most from your MVHR. So you have to have a good air type building or you'll never get your heat recovery efficiencies. So now you're talking about not only are you retrofitting in a ventilation system, but you're retrofitting in tapes and membranes and trying to make it more airtight. So again, the chicken or the egg. So these are just a couple of case studies. I'll just quickly run through them. Just a few shock and photographs that we have. So this, the MVHR was turned off. Um, now it was, these pictures came in from uh, two EVA. So it was, the system was put in in 2007, 2008. So there was no uh, validation or anything done on it. But um, so what happened was it shows that the negative effects on a dwelling from a poorly installed MVHR unit. So what happened was it was so poorly installed, you can see the runs of duct and they're all bunched up there all over the place. So what happened was there was no connection here. It was just duct tape holding the duct onto the hole in the wall, the outlet, um, hard bends on it. Okay, lots of flexible ducting. So the unit failed. It was eventually turned off. They had no supply in the bedrooms. They had two out on the landing though. So I don't know what that was about. And also the filters were on the outside of the um, diffuser and they were black dirty as well. So these guys were sent in to expect, inspect it to see what they could do to improve the air quality in the house. So they had some job ahead of them. This is another one. So I said the shortest run reduction as possible with the least amount of ends. Uh, I don't know what's going on there, but I wouldn't like to be trying to get that into a drop ceiling. Here we have ducts coming in. So we've again bunched up ducts going down through the floor. So they need to be separated so they can be all made airtight. This is a better install of ducting. Okay, so it seems nice and tidy there, but at the same time, we want slow sweeping bends on it, right? So we want to get from A to B in the shortest run of ducting as possible. So this duct is nearly running back on itself. 
So if you take out those bends, the fan won't have to work harder. You can turn down your fan a little bit. Again, same here, it looks lovely and tidy, but at the same time, we could uh, tidy up on the ducts, make the ducts a lot shorter. This is another example. Um, this is the extract to an MVHR unit. It's been running for nine years like that. Uh, the ductum was never cleaned, uh, probably no antistatic ductum. So you want to get antistatic antimicrobial so the dirt can't build up on it and germs and stuff can't, uh, can't live on it either. Um, so the NVHR unit and manifolds uh, were inside the thermal envelope and accessible, so cleaning was possible. Um, the, homeowner, the homeowner was great for changing the filters, but they just didn't understand beyond the unit. I have to change the filters in this, but didn't understand there's a whole lot of ductwork and stuff going on as well. So um, the flow rate for that diffuser, as you can expect, is pretty unknown. So I'd say it wasn't great. Um, so then, even though this is up in the attic, this is an example of how, it, how you can do it right. So there's a good depth of insulation on that. The unit's up on a stable base. Um, these are kept far enough away. So we have our minimum of our two meter distance and we're going from A to B in the shortest runs we can. We're gonna have bends on them, but just minimize them and short, shortest run of ductance as possible. So that's it. Any questions?